Hello, and welcome to our presentation on stroke prevention. This presentation was developed by the Bi-State Stroke Consortium, which is comprised of stroke coordinators from both Kansas and Missouri. We hope that you'll be able to take away information on what a stroke is, including the signs and symptoms, what are some stroke treatment options, and what you can do to reduce your own stroke risk. Stroke is the fifth leading cause of death in the United States and is the leading cause of disability. This map on the right is the stroke death rates in the United States from the years 2017 to 2019. The darker purple shading in an area is the higher stroke death rate in that area. A few more stroke facts for you. Someone suffers a stroke every 40 seconds. 800,000 Americans suffer strokes each year. Every four minutes, someone dies of a stroke. During a stroke, 32,000 brain cells die per second, which equals two weeks of a healthy brain life. And 3.6 years are lost for every hour stroke is left untreated. First, we're gonna start off talking about what is a stroke. A stroke occurs when blood flow to the brain is interrupted by a blocked or burst blood vessel. We will be going more in depth to the types of strokes on the future slides. Okay. So next we're gonna be talking about the different types of strokes. And when talking about strokes, it's important to know there are two different types of stroke. The first type is called an ischemic stroke. This is the most common type and it makes up about 85% of all strokes. So it's a large percentage of all of our strokes. An ischemic stroke is when there is a blockage in a blood vessel that causes a sudden loss of blood flow to an area of the brain. This is very important because blood carries oxygen and the brain requires oxygen to survive. Without blood to that part of the brain, the cells will begin to die. There are two different causes for having this type of stroke. The first cause is called a thrombosis. So this is what, when cells clump together and cause a narrowing of a blood vessel shown here in this top right image. You can see this narrowing. Um, and when it becomes so narrow that blood does not flow past that blockage, that's when this stroke occurs. The second cause is called an emboli. And this is when a clot travels from somewhere else in the body and gets stuck in a vessel in the brain. So larger blood vessels lead to the smaller blood vessels you can see here, and it gets stuck. So we want you to come to the hospital to help us try to reverse that stroke, remove that, that spot that is blocking the blood flow. Next, we have a TIA. And this is, a sub, this is kind of a precursor to an ischemic stroke. Um, the longer version is called a transient ischemic attack. Sometimes you might hear people call this a mini stroke. Um, it's not really a stroke, but people do use that term. This is when a person experiences sudden onset of neurological signs or symptoms, but they last for 24 hours or less. So this is a temporary blockage of a blood vessel in the brain without any permanent damage. But as the years have gone on, we have had better imaging capabilities. Um, and so we've actually been able to see that a th about a third of the patients that we once would have thought had a TIA actually had an infarction or cell death in the brain, meaning they actually had a stroke. Therefore, it's really important that even if symptoms go away, you still call 911 so EMS can bring you to the hospital for a stroke workup. Another reason is that TIAs are often a warning sign for potential future strokes. So it's really important that you get seen and we work you up to make sure um, that we do everything we can to prevent any future stroke. All right, next, the next type is called a hemorrhagic stroke. There are two subtypes of hemorrhagic stroke um, and it depends on where they occur in the brain. The first of these is called an intracerebral hemorrhage or ICH for short. This is the most common type of a hemorrhagic stroke um, and it occurs when an artery in the brain bursts or ruptures and it floods the surrounding tissue in the brain with blood um, and the most common cause of this type of stroke is high blood pressure. 
Later in this presentation, we'll talk more about those risk factors and how to manage those. The second less common type is called a subarachnoid hemorrhage or SAH for short. And this happens when bleeding occurs between um, the brain and the thin tissue that covers it. These are often caused by the rupturing or bursting of an aneurysm. You can see right here on this picture, this is an aneurysm and it is a outpouching or weakened area of a blood vessel. And it's prone to rupture causing bleeding into that surrounding tissue. Another cause of a subarachnoid hemorrhage is physical trauma. So it's important to be seen at the hospital for these two. Okay, now that you know the two different types of stroke, um, the next step is knowing how to identify a stroke. And the best way that we teach everyone is with the acronym BFAST. Each one of these letters stands for a different symptom. It helps you to remember um, the wide variations of symptoms that can um, present as a stroke. So the first is a B and that stands for balance. Um, what you're looking for is, are you seeing a person who's suddenly having trouble with balance or coordination? Have they said they're dizzy, the room is spinning, or they have a headache? Next is eyes. Um, is this person experiencing um, sudden blurred or doubled vision um, or a sudden loss of vision in one or both eyes without any pain? Next is F and this stands for facial droop. Does the person have one side of their face um, drooping or are they saying that it's numb? One way you can help test for this is ask this person to smile. Uh, is one side higher than the other or those lines, that smile lines that you normally see is one side flattened. That can help you know if they're having facial droop. Next is A and that stands for arm weakness. It can also go with legs. Um, are they saying their arm is weak? or numb. One way you can test for this, if you're not sure, is ask them to raise their arms up like they're holding a platter. Do you notice that one side starts to drift downward? That could be a sign of that arm weakness. Next is S, and this stands for speech difficulty. Um, when, when you talk with them, are you noticing that they're having a difficult time speaking or they're not able to speak at all? Um, or is it hard for you to understand them or them understanding you? That could be a sign. Um, if you're not so sure, uh, one thing you can do is ask them to repeat a simple sentence. One sentence could be, the sky is blue. Are they able to say it correctly? If not, that could be a sign of stroke. The last letter stands for time, time to call 911. If you notice any of the, the symptoms in BFAST, it's very important that you call 911 to get them to the hospital as soon as possible um, because they could be having a stroke. Risk factors for stroke can be classified into two general types, modifiable and non-modifiable. The risk factors that cannot be treated uh, related to stroke are age. Uh, this means that uh, as we get older, the risk of having a stroke increases. The risk of having a stroke after the age of 55 actually doubles. Being ill is more common in having a stroke than it is in women. Race uh, is also a non-modifiable risk factor. It is true that African-Americans have the highest risk of stroke followed by Hispanics, Asians, and Caucasians. A prior stroke also increased the risk um, of having another stroke. And your family history can also play a part in your risk for stroke. If you have a parent, a grandparent, a sister or a brother who has had a stroke, this increases your risk for also having a stroke. This feature is also linked to other risk factors that run in families, such as high blood pressure, high cholesterol, diabetes, or a genetic disorder. The good news about stroke is that it is largely preventable. Approximately 80% of strokes can be prevented, but prevention requires that you know your numbers and that you also understand your risk factors and take action to change behaviors that increase your risk for stroke. There are certain health 
and lifestyle issues known as risk factors that increase your chances of having a stroke. The leading risk factor is high blood pressure. It's important for you to know what your blood pressure is so that you can talk to your doctor about treatment if you have high blood pressure. It, it is also important to know your cholesterol numbers as well as your blood sugars as these risk factors also contribute to an increased risk of stroke. A modifiable risk factor is a risk factor that can be changed and can assist in reducing your risk of having a stroke. Many times this includes recommendations about your diet and, and your activity level. Sometimes a medication may need to be added to assist in treating a condition associated uh, with a modifiable risk factor. High blood pressure is the leading cause or the number one cause of stroke, and it causes an unnecessary stress on your blood vessels. This will cause blood vessels to do one of two things. They can thicken or they can break open. The plaque that builds up in your blood vessels related to both high cholesterol as well as high blood pressure can cause a blockage in the artery. It's important for you to check your blood pressure um, at least once a week. And you can check that at a local pharmacy or a grocery store um, if you don't have a blood pressure cuff at home to check. You can also do this in uh, visits to, you, to your health clinic or to your doctor's office. A blood pressure being greater than 140 over 90 is considered high. Most people are able to control their blood pressure through a combination of diet, exercise, and medication. It's important for you to talk to your doctor about a treatment plan to control blood pressure. High cholesterol um, increases your risk of blocked arteries, and a blocked artery in the brain can cause a stroke. Cholesterol levels are monitored through blood work. If the LDL is high, um, a number greater than 100, or your HDL, which is another cholesterol number, is low, your doctor will advise you to change your diet to increase your activity level and may actually prescribe a medication for you to improve your cholesterol levels. Both cholesterol and high blood pressure can increase your chances for having a heart attack or a stroke. So underlying heart disease um, is a thing that we also consider a modifiable stroke risk factor because we can check our blood pressure, know our cholesterol numbers and take action to correct those. Cigarette smoking also increases our risk for stroke. If you smoke, uh, we recommend that you stop. I know many people think that cutting down um, is, is a way to improve their risk factors, but it is most important for you to stop. Diabetes is also a modifiable risk factor, but then you have to know your numbers. So knowing what your uh, sugar levels are and talking to your doctor about diet and exercise modification, as well as the need for medications is important. If you have a condition such as atrial fibrillation, um, which is an irregular heart rhythm, this can in risk, increase your risk of stroke related to a clot traveling from your heart into your brain. Most of the time, your doctor will uh, consider putting you on some sort of a blood thinning agent to reduce your risk of stroke. And lastly, as we spoke about lifestyle modification, such as improved exercise, as well as monitoring your diet, um, improving your intake of um, vegetables, fruits, um, and reducing, uh, you know, diet that's high in processed foods as well as high fat can improve your risk for stroke. And then also reducing your alcohol intake as well as avoiding any type of illicit drug use uh, also reduces your risk for stroke. So we just reviewed the reasons why you should be fast in getting to the hospital and also your risk factors. But why would people delay seeking treatment? There's lots of reasons. People might not recognize the symptoms. Some stroke symptoms can be subtle and confusing, especially if you're alone. But we hope that you'll remember those signs and symptoms that we have taught you in previous slides. People may also think that the symptoms um, will go away. They might think it's not really a real stroke, I'm just tired, or one I've heard commonly is my arm just fell asleep and I was waiting for it to wake up. As we just discussed, symptoms can come and go and frequently return, and these sometimes can be an early indicator of an impending stroke. So always 
um, seek treatment, even if the symptoms go away, you want to make sure that you're not having the early warning signs of stroke. People also may think that nothing can be done. Everyone knows someone that's been debilitated by a stroke, but it doesn't have to end that way. You may also worry about the cost. Even if you don't have insurance, programs do exist that help cover the cost of stroke care. And treating a stroke is much cheaper than living with the effects of a debilitating stroke for the rest of your life. The fear of hospitals or distrust for hospitals might be another reason why people don't seek immediate treatment. Just know that the hospital is the only place qualified to care for your acute stroke. You may also be worried about wait times in the ER, but just know that strokes are brain attacks and are treated as a, a neurological emergency. And so no stroke gets placed in the waiting room, they immediately get back to um, assessment to determine whether the patient is eligible for treatment. Instead of thinking all the things in the previous slide, we want you to remember that you can reduce the impact of stroke if you focus on the three R's of stroke care. Reducing your risk, follow the recommendations that we made in previous slide, as well as talking to your primary care doctor to reduce your stroke risk. Recognizing stroke symptoms, so those BFAS that we've talked about a few times now, and respond immediately by calling 911 because every minute matters. It's always good to prepare for an emergency ahead of time. So it's really helpful if you have some items available to you before an emergency might happen. Things like emergency contacts should be programmed in your cell phone or even available on a list that you place either on the fridge, by the door, somewhere that can be quickly accessed in case of an emergency. It's also a good idea to have a list of medications on that same paper, um, either in your phone or hanging on the fridge or by the door like we talked about. All of the medications that you're currently taking, including vitamins, should be listed on this piece of paper. And also if any medications have been stopped for an upcoming procedure or various other reasons, make sure to note that on that paper. This is especially helpful to your care team when you get to the hospital to determine what stroke treatments you are eligible for. All right, so let's talk a little bit about what to expect when calling 911. When calling 911, it's acceptable to say that I'm having a stroke or I think I might be having a stroke. Just know that the dispatchers are also gonna ask more questions about it. These 911 dispatchers are specially trained to know what questions to ask. So don't be alarmed if some of the questions are confusing. Um, the stroke assessment has already begun and they're gonna be noting all of these things and giving that information to the team that's coming to care for you. One of the most important questions they will ask is when the patient was last known well or last known normal. This is the time that the symptoms have started or the patient was last known to be a normal state if you, don't, if you did not experience um, the onset of the symptoms with them. This is a vital piece of information that helps to determine when treatment modalities are available to the patient and which treatments can be done. When the first responders or paramedics arrive, a lot is gonna happen very quickly. This can feel scary, but know that they're collecting lots of information as fast as possible in order to determine the best location to take the patient to. Time is brain, so the faster they can get the patient headed towards the optimal location, the better outcome for the patient. En route to the hospital, they will alert the emergency department of their pending arrival and give them a report of all the information they've collected. This allows the receiving hospital to be quickly ready for the patient's arrival and have certain uh, time-sensitive testing ready to go once the patient arrives. This is why it is so important to call 911 instead of just driving yourself or a loved one to the hospital in, when stroke signs and symptoms appear. Next, I'm gonna pass this off to Kathy, and she is going to talk about what to expect in the emergency department. When you arrive in the emergency room, they will do a quick assessment at the door and then you will go to the, have a CAT scan of your brain. Um, that CAT scan will quickly tell us whether you are having the ischemic type stroke or the hemorrhagic type stroke that we talked about previously. They will then do a baseline neuro assessment 
and do some vital signs and try to um, summarize and get a complete grasp on all of the types of symptoms that are occurring. They will further try to narrow down that last known normal that we just discussed. They will do some vital signs, some lab work, and do know that there will be a complete neuro stroke team at the bedside. So if you are the patient and you are going to feel like you're completely surrounded by a uh, just a, in a huge group of people that is totally normal, um, do know that they are um, just working feverishly to um, get a uh, control on the situation and get you the fastest stroke care um, as possible. Um, because again, as we've talked, time is brain. And um, so they are trying to do as much as they can as quickly as they can. If you are the loved one um, and you are in the room, it will look like there's a flurry of activity at your loved one's bedside. Um, conversely, you may end up in the waiting room and you may feel like um, you just don't know what's going on. That's normal too. It very much depends on uh, the uh, facility and um, some rooms are large and they can accommodate having um, family members in the rooms. Others, they don't have as much room and they'll have you guys in the waiting room. So it varies from facility to facility. Um, do know that at some point, um, the physician that is caring um, for you or your loved one will come and a rapid decision will need to be made about a treatment. Um, and that's what we're gonna talk about next. So depending on what type of stroke you are or your loved one is having, there are various treatment options. If you're having an ischemic stroke um, or a hemorrhagic stroke, there are different types of treatments available. For the ischemic stroke, or as we talked about earlier, the stroke with the clot, um, either um, from the clot having traveled or from the clot near the narrowing, um, the most common um, treatment is the clot buster, and that is usually in the form of a medication or clot busting medication, and which is what you're looking at here in this middle um, picture here. And um, that medication is specifically designed to do just that. It helps dissolve that clot so the blood can then be restored and the flow can um, resume to those um, at-risk tissues. Um, another type of uh, treatment is um, a thrombectomy, um, and that's this top right picture up here. And it is uh, designed um, to actually go in there and pull that clot out. There are numerous different types. A very specialized physician is trained to do that. They can actually go up there and pull that out with a cage, which is kind of what you're seeing in that picture there. They can also do that um, with a little bitty special catheter that actually aspirates or vacuums out that clot. Um, but they um, have a specialized time window to be able to do that. So um, it is very um, situation specific for that um, modality to be an option. Um, other treatments are designed to keep clots from being able to form in the future. And that involves blood thinners and antiplatelet medications. And uh, those are very patient specific as well. Then there are very, very specialized um, treatment options that have to do with those narrowings that we talked about and the location of those narrowings. So there are procedures called carotid endarterectomies and then there are angioplasties and stents. And those involve um, going into those specific locations and opening those um, narrowings up. So carotid endarterectomies involve an opening those narrowings up if they're in the neck. And then there are angioplasties and stents which can be done if the narrowings are up in the brain. Uh, now, if you're having a, or if your loved one's having a hemorrhagic stroke, uh, remember that's the strokes that occur um, when there's a blood vessel that's burst, um, whether that's from a ruptured aneurysm or from a hypertension that's ruptured a blood vessel. And um, that causes the bleeding in the brain. 
There are various treatment modalities, depending on whether that's an aneurysm that's ruptured or a vessel that's not going to be able to um, be repaired like an aneurysm will. Um, there are some surgical options that are available. There are some lesions that bleed that aren't necessarily able to be surgically corrected. So it depends on the location of the bleed for those. Um, in the right bottom corner of your screen here, um, there's a picture of a coil. Um, that is a surgical option for an aneurysm that's bled. And that's um, a coil is a, a little contraption that goes into one of those aneurysms and it helps to make that aneurysm clot and um, so it'll quit bleeding. Um, sometimes they can go in there and if a um, bleed has formed a nice big clot, um, they can go in there and surgically remove that. Um, some bleeds are in a location and they have kind of spread out in the tissue. And there's not a lot that they can do surgically to remove those and those will be treated medically and they um, work to help reduce the blood pressure and just help reduce um, the swelling on the brain and that sort of thing. Um, so all of these treatments are very, very patient specific. So the physician will come and discuss these options with you at the time of you or your loved one's stroke, and they will present the treatment options that are available to you based on your stroke, how long um, it's been since the actual stroke onset, and um, treatment decisions are very, very patient and time specific. So don't be alarmed if a physician doesn't present all of these options to you. Not all options are applicable for each patient with each stroke. Even if a patient has multiple strokes over the course of the, their lifetime, not all treatment options will be uh, appropriate for each stroke each time. Um, they are always patient and um, stroke specific. So um, work with your physician um, e at each stroke um, to determine which, which treatment is appropriate for you. Um, during your hospital stay, um, we focus on treating your current stroke and helping to prevent another stroke from happening in the future. Um, after you've had your stroke and uh, your stroke treatment, um, we will do an MRI and that MRI helps us to determine the exact location of your stroke and how much damage that stroke has done. Uh, that helps us to determine what kind of residual effects you're going to have from your stroke and how much damage that stroke has had ultimately. And um, when we do treatment for your stroke, that can help minimize damage that that stroke has done. In some cases, it can help us completely um, prevent permanent damage, and which is what we'd like to see. Um, other treatments that are other um, testing that we will do during your stay and um, will help us try to determine what kind of um, factors help play into you having your stroke in the beginning or originally. So we will do some carotid Doppler, some heart echoes, and that can help give us a clue into what caused that stroke. And that will also help us keep you from having a stroke in the future. Other things that we will do is some testing on your blood and we will do some blood pressure monitoring, um, some heart rate monitoring and some other um, testing that will help us determine uh, or try to at least determine what caused that stroke. Again, those will all help us keep you from having a stroke in the future if at all possible. The other thing that we will do while you're in the hospital is help you rehabilitate from that stroke. So we will work with physical therapy, occupational therapy, speech therapy to help you start to heal and rehabilitate from that stroke. We will also work with um, some discharge planning to help get those therapies going and help keep those therapies going after you leave. So our goal is to make that transition from inpatient therapy to outpatient therapy as smooth and as seamless as possible. So um, you will have as minimal of a um, lapse in your therapy as possible. We will also work with your physicians. So we will set up your follow up appointments um, with neurology, primary care, and any other ancillary services, uh, services and get those appointments scheduled for you before you are discharged. 
You also will receive education um, on any of your stroke risk factors, and uh, we will get you as much knowledge as we can so you understand any causative factors for your stroke. And um, we will also help you um, learn as much as you can about prevention measures to help keep you from having strokes in the future. So um, to summarize, we're gonna remember the be fast algorithm. Um, Cause remember brain loss or bra time lost is brain lost. So um, remember B is for balance. Um, if you feel dizzy or unsteady, that can be a sign for a stroke. Eyes, um, if you have sudden vision loss or double vision, that can be something to um, consider as having a, a stroke symptom. Face, um, if you have facial drooping or numbness or tingling on one side of your face or the other. Um, arm, A is for arm, um, if you have ar um, weakness uh, or on one side of your leg uh, as well, um, it's a symptom for stroke. Um, S is for speech, um, if you have trouble speaking or if you have trouble um, understanding others, it's a symptom for stroke and the T is for time. Um, remember, um, this is not something that you wanna drive yourself to the hospital for, it's gonna call 911. So if you know any, notice any of these warning signs for stroke, you're gonna get help immediately. Uh, quick medical attention um, can save lives. Uh, we see it every day. So uh, do not hesitate to get help for your stroke. Um, thank you for your time.